Hello, and thank you for checking in for Golf Smarter Mulligans. I'm Fred Green. A little introduction. Golf Smarter Mulligans are older interviews with PGA teaching professionals pulled from the archives of the Golf Smarter podcast. Golf Smarter launched in 2005, just a few months after iTunes introduced podcasts and a full year and a half before the first iPhone. Podcasts were so new, I think there was only one other golf podcast at the time, and I'm pretty sure it's no longer in production. Actually, you'll hear me make reference to listening to the show on your iPod. (laughs) Here we are in 2019, and podcasts have exploded with more than 600,000 different titles available and probably more than 50 golf podcasts. So with all that content, Apple Podcasts and all the others only carry 300 episodes of any show. And since the library of Golf Smarter exceeds 680 episodes, I felt it only fair to bring back the interviews that offered the best golf instruction we provide that you've probably never heard. Listen, great golf instruction never gets old, as proven by golf's best-selling book, Ben Hogan's Five Lessons, which was published in 1957. Golf Smarter Mulligans is brought to you by TwoGuysWithGolfBalls.com, providing hand-inspected premium used golf balls at a fraction of the cost of new balls, and there's free shipping. Now let me sweeten the deal. Golf Smarter listeners get an additional 10% off every order every time with a coupon code GOLFSMARTER. Trust me, you'll never be able to tell the difference between the new and the Eagle quality balls from twoguyswithgolfballs.com. So, here we're going to launch Golf Smarter Mulligans the same way we introduced Golf Smarter with episode number one in December of 2005, talking about the mental game with the author of golf's most popular book on the topic, Zen Golf with Dr. Joseph Parent. Hi, how are you, Fred? I'm doing fine, thank you. Interesting, you have a PhD in psychology and you're a PGA Tour instructor. Correct. That's an interesting combination. Well, the mental game is uh, really coming into its own on the tour. And who are some of your students? Well, the the top player that I've worked with is Vijay Singh. And then I've worked with others like uh, David Toms and Jerry Kelly. Uh, Tim Petrovic, we got our first win this year. Uh, Steve Lowry, a number of other players. And how is it that you're able to help them? These guys obviously have all the mechanics down. When you get to that level, their mechanics are all equal. Is the difference the psychology at that point? Well, as you know, um, no golfer ever feels like he has his mechanics down. (laughs) And uh, golf being a fickle mistress, anybody who who has the hubris to think that they do have their mechanics down, uh, they find that they disappear pretty pretty quickly. So uh, the pros are always fine-tuning uh, their technique. I like, I like to call it technique rather than mechanics because I want to move away from the notion of a mechanical uh, or robot-like swinging of a golf club and more into the idea of uh, fluid motion that you have technique to perform. The mental game is about how your mind runs your body, and that's really, really the key. If you were uh, to ask me uh, to sum up what I do in, in one sentence, it's I help golfers get out of their own way. And I've never met a golfer who didn't know what it felt like to be in their own way. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I know that uh, have become my own worst enemy out there. We want you to uh, help your, you use your mind as an ally instead of an enemy. So what is your approach? What is it that you do teach? Well, I wrote a book called Zen Golf, and the, the structure of it really summarizes the, the way that I approach the game. The, the first section is, co- is uh, called A Different Perspective. And again, uh, in the mechanical way of teaching, there tends to be a focus on getting all the positions right, getting... <clears throat> all the moves right, uh, and that really gets in the way when it comes to playing golf. Yes, you have to work with those things in learning how to swing a club, but once you know how to do something, thinking about how you're doing it just gets in the way. So in, in Zen Golf, we have a chapter called Hitting a Target 10,000 Times in a Row, 
Uh, do you think you could hit a target 10,000 times in a row? I don't think I could, but if we worked together long enough, I'd be convinced that I could. <laughs> well, I want to tell you, you've already done it. And, uh, and you've probably done it a few times, because excluding periods of inebriation, uh, when's the last time you missed your mouth with a fork full of food? Do I have to admit that? <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> no, it's true. So, so you've, you've hit that target 10,000 times in a row without thinking about how you cock your wrist when the fork lifts off the plate and whether you keep your elbow at your side or not. Okay, I'll buy that. Okay, so what we want to do is move people out of their thinking mind and into their intuitive mind when they swing the golf club. The challenge in golf is you have to use your thinking mind to plan the shot, and then you have to turn over control to your intuitive mind and let your body swing and get out of the way so it can do what you've already trained it to do. And however well you've trained it, that's uh, the quality of the shot that you'll produce. So, so uh, the perspective I take with Zen Golf is very, very different. In, in most instructional modes, they're telling the student, unless you do everything right and don't do anything wrong, you'll hit a bad shot. And what I'm saying is, if you get out of your own way and let your body do what it knows how to do without trying to make sure it does everything right, you'll hit a good shot. So the baseline, in fact, is good shots that you can interfere with rather than your baseline is a bad shot and you have to figure out how to do it right each time. It's much easier and much less stressful. And that's one of the things that I would like to help people get to is having more fun on the golf course, exactly. less stressful. Um, I, I firmly believe that when you're on the driving range, it's time to practice. But when you step up to the first tee, it's time to stop practicing. Well, then it's time to play. You don't say, hey, do you want to go out and work around a golf? Right. You say you want to go out and play around a golf. And, and I encountered this on the tour. There's an interesting phenomenon for, for many of the players and that is, during the practice rounds, they have a game with their, with their buddies, and they play on Tuesday. And uh, if they're in the pro-am, they play with the, the amateurs on Wednesday. And then it's Thursday, and they say, okay, time to get to work. Hmm. And I, I think that that's backwards. I think that what they want to do is Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday is when they work to do their preparation. Work, combination of work and rest and to prepare themselves so that when Thursday comes, they can let, let it go and go play. I think for your average golfer, they would say that if only I could play better, I'd enjoy it more. But I like to say, if you'd enjoy it more, you'd play better. And it makes so much sense. Um, I mean, obviously, if, you, if you're watching on TV and you're watching some of the events, these guys are working very hard, but they're still playing golf. That's right, and... and if you think about it, sometimes there's a guy who's been in a slump for a long time, and they interview him afterwards, and uh, usually what they, and, you know, and, and they win and break through. And say, so usually um, what, what happens is they say, you know, I was out here grinding and grinding and grinding, and it wasn't getting to be fun anymore. And I decided if it's not going to be fun, I don't want to be doing this. So I said, what the heck, I'm just going to go out and have fun and see what happens. And lo and behold, they win. I've never heard somebody interviewed saying, you know, I was having a lot of fun playing out here, and I thought, you know, I better get to work and really grind this week. <laughs> I've heard that one. Yeah, and how many times have you heard a baseball player interviewed saying, all I was trying to do is make contact, I wasn't trying to hit the ball out of the park? Same thing, same principle. Personally, when I'm having a tough part of the middle of my round, and I just say, you know, forget it, I'm just going to hit the ball, all of a sudden, those last couple of holes, I start shooting pars. Well, here's... Here's what usually happens. You, you start out, and you hit a couple of good shots, and then you hit a bad one. And you go, what did I do wrong? Right. And you start trying to fix your swing. You, you do one fix, and you hit a couple of good shots, and you hit another bad one. You say, okay, I'm doing something else as well. And then you do two fixes, then three fixes, then four fixes. Pretty soon it's, you know, take it back low and slow, keep the elbow to the side, cock your wrist, do this, do this, do this, do this, don't do that, don't do that. And you have... 43 things you're trying to do and 27 you're trying to not do. And around the 16th or 17th hole, you, you, you can't even remember which end of the club to hold. <laughs> and you say, oh, the heck with this, I'm just going to get up and hit it. Pew! Right down the middle. And you par in and you say, see you tomorrow. 
well, let's save ourselves the trouble of all that fixing of something that isn't really even broken. It's just somehow interference showed up and you got in the way. So the, the real key points to understand is when you don't hit a shot that's at your, your average capability level, it's not because you forgot how to swing a golf club. It is because there was some aspect of mental interference. It can also be something in your setup, but it's not in forgetting how to swing a golf club. So how do we change that perspective and get into our optimum mode for uh, producing the quality of golf shot that we're able to produce? That's where the middle section of my book comes in, the PAR approach. Preparation, action, response to results. You prepare by having a clear picture, commit to the shot, get composed, and I use a lot with breathing, of breathing to do that before the shot. Then the action is this letting go rather than trying to guide it or steer it or make sure that it comes out right. And then the response to results is not beating yourself up after a poor shot, but reflecting and saying, hmm, what got in the way, and learning from it. Usually we take, you know, we have a good shot and we go, whew, I'll take that, as if we had nothing to do with it. Yeah, exactly. We hit a bad one and we go, there's my slice again, and we own that. And that only reinforces the poor shots. And if we beat ourselves up after a bad shot, it's going to, what, what are we going to expect the next time we face that situation? Another one. Because it really sinks it into our memory. I played with a gentleman this weekend who, on a specific hole, he said, I hit it in the water every single time here. Well, what, is, what do you think he expects to do that time, this, this time up? He probably took out an old ball. He walks up to it going, avoid the water, avoid the water, avoid the water. And all he's hearing is but he water. If he always hits it in, then, he, then there's no hope. <laughs> always but, means always <laughs> well how do we convince them that those shots don't count anymore right that's right that's in the past and uh and to say i always hit it in the water you, you, you that would that would mean to say oh you're a fortune teller as well so you you not only remember the past but you know the future so the the whole point is to say the problem is you're focused on the results and not on your process and focusing on the results interferes with the process. Focusing on the process gives you the best chance of results, of good results. And you hear on the tour, the announcers are saying, what a great recovery shot. Mm -hmm. Where that last shot, the shot that you just took isn't a recovery from anything. It's just this shot, right? It's the shot. Now, you, you, there is karma involved. That's the law of cause and effect. Okay. And where you put the ball on your first shot... Is your karma <laughs> for where you have to play it from. <laughs> now, there's a chapter in Zen Golf called Isn't Where You Have to Play It From Punishment Enough? <laughs> so you don't have to beat yourself up for hitting it in a bad place. You, you do have to recover from, uh, from having um, interfered with your previous shot. But once you hole out, the, the karma ends. And you have a completely fresh start on the next hole, unless you bring it with you mentally. Physically, each hole is completely independent of the previous. It's how much you bring along with you mentally that could interfere, either interfere with or support better play for the next hole. Let's take a short break here. We'll come right back. All right, we're back with Dr. Joe Parent, author of Zen Golf. And let's talk for just a moment about Zen Golf. The book has been out for a while. I saw it at an airport. I read just a page or so and went, you know, and I got hooked immediately. So I, I purchased the book and I really liked the book and Thank ended up buying it for a number of my friends. We, uh, you know, we do a golf trip every year and so we each hand out gifts. And this is what I brought was the, the book of Zen Golf. Well, that's great. I had a, a wonderful opportunity to uh, get a call from Barbara Nicholas, who uh, did the same thing. So, um, I, and and Barbara and Jack are two people I admire tremendously. That's a very nice compliment. Mm -hmm. And she I bought it and bought it for a bunch of friends. Well, it helps. 
it's not a difficult read and it's not a thick book. No, I tried to make it as simple and clear as possible and use ordinary language. There are some uh, books on, because the subtitle is Mastering the Mental Game, and there are books on psychology that use a lot of psychological terms that, that ordinary people aren't familiar with. Uh, there are Eastern wisdom books, and obviously Zen golf takes from the Eastern wisdom traditions, uh, and they use sometimes foreign language terms, and, and I avoid that completely. It's, it's simple, clear, ordinary language that uh, any golfer at any level can identify with. It had a um, almost an immediate impact on my game. Um, well, thank you. I, once I, I started emails uh, about that a lot. Yeah, and that's the thing that that really blows my mind about the products that are out there today. They seem to make golf more difficult and not as much fun. I mean, if you work with this product for the next six months, you too can lower your score. Nah, <laughs> I don't well, want to. It adds it adds something additional and. Uh, Whenever you add things on, you have to add it, integrate it, and that changes everything else. And the approach that I take is to go the other way and say, uh, let's, let's take a look at what you already have, what you already can do, and what's getting in the way, what's extra. Let's take the extra out of the way. And the, the signature story in the book in, in Zen Golf is the gold statue story where a young man has a clay statue and wants to plate it with gold and finds out that he never needed to, that it was a gold statue that had gotten covered with clay. And so instead of adding gold to it, all he needed to do was remove the clay, and the gold he already had was was already there. So trust your swing. Is this one of the messages that I'm getting from you here? Yes. Let me work with that a little bit. Uh, I don't like to call it a swing as, as a noun. I like to use the word swinging a club, so trust the way you swing a club. Okay. When you call it a swing, then it becomes a fixed thing. It has only one shape that's right, and everything else is wrong. It doesn't give you a lot of leeway. But if you think of the way you swing, it would be like the way you walk. It's not exactly the same every time, but it's pretty much the same, and you already know how to do it. And that's really the key. You can't trust something you don't, that you think you don't know how to do. And if you think that a perfect swing means every single thing right and, and, and avo- doing all the do's and avoiding all the don'ts, that's really hard to do. And how can you trust yourself that you can do something that's so hard to do? But you trust yourself to walk. That's easy to do. You trust yourself to uh, swing a golf club but not to make a perfect swing. And that's the difference. So the the whole key to trust is pre-acceptance and saying, I can handle however it comes out, and therefore I can let myself swing freely. If you don't, if you feel like you can handle it and you don't trust yourself, you'll guide it and hold back. And that's the interference we've been talking about. How do you approach a new golf course? It's all about the target? Well, uh, I'll share a story with you um, that applies to this, and, and that is uh, at a book signing, someone raised their hand and asked me a question, said, I, I, only pro- I only play once or twice a month and I never get a chance to practice. Do you have any advice on how I can improve my game? And, of course, everyone laughed, because how silly is that? And I said, actually, I do have some. Cultivate your sense of humor. When you get to a new course, the first thing you need to do is have a sense of humor about how the day is going to go and lower your expectations and say, well, I don't have experience with this. So why would I expect myself to know what I'm going to face? Uh, Of course, you provide some advanced knowledge, but there's no knowledge like actually experiencing the course for trust to, to come up. So what I would tell them is, first of all, and, and this, this goes with Golf Smarter, the first thing that you want to do is get as much knowledge as you can and know what uh, is out there that maybe you don't see. And here's the, here's the real key. You say, today I'm going to focus more on the quality of the shots that I produce rather than where they end up because I'm not familiar with the course. And if you take that one, one suggestion and just say, 
today I'm going to focus more on the quality of my shots rather than how they turn out because it's a new course, and I'm going to give myself a break about uh, how the ball bounces, I'm going to have the best time. And don't worry about your score until you're all done with your round. Well, even don't worry about your score then, but certainly don't worry about your score as you go. That's on a new course or an old course. I don't know very many people whose score counts when they turn it in after 14 holes. So so keeping track up to that point doesn't do you a whole lot of good. All it does is it distract you and cause interference. Actually, I played with a guy once where after 14 holes, he left. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, I always play to par. I take 72 shots and then I leave. Well, that's an old Bob Hope, Hope joke. He said, I never shoot over 75. Sometimes I finish 14 old, sometimes I finish 15, but I never shoot over 75. <laughs> what can we expect to see out of Zen Golf now? Anything new on the horizon? Yes, I'm working on uh, a new book. The tentative title is Zen Putting and Other Arts of the Game. It'll focus on uh, putting and some uh, particular uh, shots that are of interest to, uh, to golfers that, that aren't usually covered in the, in the general books. And uh, hopefully it'll be uh, out uh, for the holiday season next year. Is there any audio versions of Zen Golf that we can find? Yes. Uh, I recorded the audio book. It's the entire book unabridged uh, on a four-CD set. If you go to the website, uh, zengolf.com, one word, zengolf.com, you will find a book cover, and you click on that, and it shows you the regular book and the audio book. Uh, and I believe there's even a download uh, when you go to uh, the audiobook that you can download it onto uh, whatever your listening device is and, and listen to the book that way. Fabulous. But people use the CDs in their cars as, uh, as kind of a preparatory um, little tape before they go to the course, and they've enjoyed that a lot. And they can do this as well with our program here, Golf Smarter, as they listen to it on their MP3 player or their iPod and listen to it while they commute or on their way to the next round of golf. Exactly. Dr. Joe Parent, thanks so much for spending time with us today. We really appreciate the insight that you've provided to us. Well, I enjoyed the conversation, Fred, and good luck with all, with all the programs that you're doing.